Hi guys, this is Vaish from Vaish IAS and uh, we are going to continue the Satish Chandra series. So uh, today again we will continue with Akbar for which the two parts are already done. Uh, before that I want to tell you something like uh, the textbook which I am following of Satish Chandra is a very old version. Okay, So it is actually in two parts where the first part is from I think the 8th century to the 14th century or something and then from the 15th century it will start in the second textbook. So I am sta directly starting in the second textbook Okay, because it is more important for history optional students as well. This uh, Because people who are writing the 2018 mains now they will need it faster that is why I started this way but do not worry about other parts once we complete this uh, 15 to 17th century or something that is the Mughal history and the end of Mughal empire we will again start from the other part also okay because I think the uh, students have the newer version where everything is in one textbook okay so that is uh, okay it will be covered okay do not worry so that was one query which I got from at least two to three students in the last one week so that will be done after we complete this set of uh, chapters okay uh, which uh, the older ones will have the south kingdoms also the Chola kingdom and all which is there in the 10th century 11th century and all okay so that will be done so that is about that now we will uh, focus on today's uh, video that is uh, Akbar versus Rajput okay so uh, mainly three things are there one is the, the matrimonial policies okay you see this Jodha Akbar and all those things uh, uh, not like specific to any queen you know, or something it is like a story of how the matrimonial lines were there then the uh, war between Akbar and Maharana Pratap okay the battle of Haldigati and then uh, the general policy of Mughals to Rajput that is the three things which we are going to discuss here and it is more of political history so uh, it will be like a story I will read it fast and then tell you the gist of uh, each thing like in between between I will take a pause and I will tell you the gist of what I am reading okay so we will focus on this thing from the actual PDF as we usually do okay so last time we did it till here now we will continue with this thing relation with the Rajput so Akbar relation with the Rajput have no have to be seen against the wider background of Mughal policy towards the powerful Rajas and Zamindas of the country. Okay, it's not like directly Rajput, but other Zamindas and Rajas were also involved in this matrimonial things. So when Humayun came back to India, he embarked upon a deliberate policy of trying to win over these elements. Okay, so he deliberately started this Humayun, okay, within the Mughal. Now, Ab Abul Fazal, okay, the one historian, okay, Navratna of Akbar, he wrote like uh, to suit the minds of the Zamindas, he entered into matrimonial alliance with them. Okay, this he means the Humayun, okay, Humayun entered into matrimonial relations with them. Thus, when uh, Jamal Khan Mewati, okay, is one of the Zamindas, okay, submitted to Humayun, he married one of the beautiful daughters himself and married uh, married the younger sister to Behram Khan. So, you don't have to remember who married whom and all, you just need to know like Humayun is the one who started it and then in course of time Akbar expanded this, okay, that is the gist of this first paragraph. Now, Baramal. So, this person will come in the next two, three pages. Okay, Baramal is actually the ruler of ruler of Amber. Okay, had uh, come to Akbar's court at Agra immediately after his accession. Uh, immediately means like young. Okay, Akbar was very young. So, he made a favorable impression on the young king for when people were running a helter, helter skelter from a maddened elephant. Okay, so some uh, chaos was going on, and so uh, Raja Baramal will uh, come. Okay, here uh, to Akbar's court. Now he will take homage in uh, under Akbar and then again one matrimonial alliance is there, this Harka Bai to Akbar, okay. So the same thing is like again twisted again like Jodha Bai, this thing and all, there are many queens and all those things that you don't have to worry who is who. But uh, like this something happened, this uh, Raja of uh, this, uh, this person, okay, Baramal, he came, okay, he came here and then uh, took homage under Akbar. Now this marriage is concept, right, this marriage is concept between Muslims and Hindus, it's not something which Humayun actually started, okay, it was happening in 14th and 15th century and just like two examples are given, this Maldio ruler, uh, Maldio is the person, okay, Maldio is the powerful ruler of Jodhpur, married to some, this thing, okay, Gujarat ruler, this uh, daughter, married to Gujarat ruler and Lalbai uh, to the Sur ruler, so something like this was happening but in, within Mughal it was Humayun who started, okay, so that you should understand because prelims question can come whether this started by Mughals or whether it was started by Akbar in specific, so you should know this was there already and with then Mughals Humayun started and Akbar expanded it. Now, most of these marriages had not led to the establishment of many stable personal relationship uh, between the concerned family. So it was not like it uh, made a stable relationship. And then this uh, fate of the girl, okay, the girl was like, it was like lost within their family's politics. So they did not have this woman empowerment kind of line if you have to include. There is nothing for the uh, women, okay. They are like, they have to follow whatever the uh, uh, king policies are. Now, the Akbar followed a different policy. So, that is where we are focusing on this chapter now. Akbar followed a different policy. He gave complete religious freedom to his Hindu wives and gave an honored place to their parents and relations in the nobility. So, that in the movie also you can see, uh, Jodha is allowed to have a temple within the premises, is allowed to do Hindu prayers and all those things within the Mughal premises, okay, which is a totally Muslim kingdom. Okay, that is one thing. 
now again uh, this uh, bharamal was made a high grandee his son uh, bhagwan das rose to the rank of 5000 and his grandson man singh to the rank of 7000 so these are very important people okay this bharamal bhagwan das man singh uh, father son grandson these three people were given great positions in mughal empire and was rose to this pretty huge uh, rank of mansabdari also okay and you should know the 7000 is one of the highest rank so this rank was accorded by akbar to only one other noble that is aziz khan kuka his foster brother so that much important was man singh in the empire of mughal okay that is the gist of this now akbar emphasized his special relationship with uh, kachwala ruler in other ways as well the infant prince again i don't think this is important okay here lot of this wives marriage and some other ruler kingdom this whole story is like this matrimonial alliance was again going on and this baramal was given importance he was placed in different different places and so it continued so akbar's policy continued okay so this is i'm skipping it okay because again see different places garkatanga again different place again mansabdari again matrimonial same story for different places they are telling that's all now akbar's rajput policy was combined with the policy of broad religious toleration so that is one difference in akbar's policy and in 1564 he abolished the jizya jizya you know it is the uh, tax which is imposed on non muslims okay also he had abolished the pilgrim tax in the movie also it is shown that uh, this uh, tirthyatra some uh, tax was there that was like abolished by akbar okay so it happened in 1564 and this forcible conversion, everything was uh, done away with. So overall, he was religiously tolerant. Now it is like the Rajput uh, places. Like uh, following the conquest of Chittor, most of the leading Rajput rulers had accepted Akbar's suzerainty and paid personal homage to him. The rulers of Jaisalmer and Bikaner had also entered into matrimonial relationship with Akbar. The only state which had stubbornly refused to accept Mughal suzerainty was Mewar. Okay. So Mewar was one place which did not agree, it's remaining everybody agreed. So Mewar is where Rana Pratap also will come. Now, although Chittor and the uh, plain area around it had come around uh, Mughal domination, Udaipur and the hilly area which formed the larger part of Mewar had remained under the control of the Rana. Okay, so that is why that place alone was not under Mughals. In 1572, Rana Pratap succeeded Rana Uday Singh to the Gaddi. A series of embassies were sent by Akbar to Maharana Pratap. So many people Akbar will send, okay, here you will see uh, Man Singh was sent, then Todarmal will be sent, okay, this full story is that thing only, okay. Here if you see, and one version is there, like uh, in movies and all they show like, Man Singh who went to this Rana Pratap court was insulted and sent back, okay, but here they are telling, it is not a historical fact, okay, it's written here, it's not a historical fact, because Rana Pratap was a kind of a courteous manner, he behaved with everyone, okay, so he will not insult anyone who comes to the court, so that is what is told here. Now, uh, see Man Singh, Bhagwan Das, Raja Todar, these are three people who came in three different types, uh, times as embassies okay from akbar's court but it was not agreed here it is mentioned like at one time it seems that the rana was prepared for a uh, compromise okay Sorry. okay compromise he put on the imperial robe sent by akbar and sent his son so what happened is rana pratap kind of agreed and then instead of going directly he sent his son okay amar singh amar singh was sent to the court with bhagwan das to do homage to akbar but uh, akbar was not happy with that okay he wanted uh, rana to come directly okay so that is why final agreement was not reached no final agreement could be reached as the proud rana was not prepared to accept akbar's demand for tendering personal homage okay so he did not personally go there now, also it seems that the Mughals wanted to keep hold of Chittor, which was not acceptable to the Rana. Okay, so there were problems and that is why Rana and Akbar will be uh, having the war, okay, later. In 1576, okay, Akbar moved to Ajmer and deputed Raja Man Singh with a force of 5,000 to lead a campaign against the Rana. In anticipation of this move, the Rana had devastated the entire territory up to Chittor so that the Mughal forces might get no food and fodder. Okay, so this thing is like a, a later in the Russian Revolution or we will see these kind of policies. Okay, this uh, uh, scorched earth policy which they call in World War and all they have used it where when uh, enemy is about to enter our territory, what we will do is we will simply uh, evacuate the whole city, okay, the path to the city. They will evacuate everything, they will poison the wells, they will burn all the buildings, they will uh, empty all the granaries, everything they will do so that when an army enters there and they will obviously need two, three days, okay, to come to the actual city. So those days they will have to return back because they have no food and water, nothing is there and they will be like forced to return back, okay. The army will be uh, uh, having to be forced. So that is the policy which uh, right from those days, okay, Maharana Pratap has followed, okay. That is what is being told here. So he had also fortified all the passes in the hills. A furious battle between the two sides were waged at Haldigati. So this is the battle of Haldigati, 1576, very important for prelims, okay. A narrow uh, defile leading to Kumbhalgarh, which was 
then the rana's capital okay so rana's capital is this place now apart from selected rajput forces the rana's van was led by hakim khan sur with his afghan contingent okay so it's like uh, in uh, rana side also this uh, muslim people were there okay thus the battle of haldigati was not a struggle between the hindus and muslims okay so because this is what now you know these uh, people around uh, now in this uh, country are simply framing everything like hindu and muslims okay whether it comes to shivaji's uh, story or whether it comes to maharana pratap story everywhere they are like uh, defaming muslim or the mughal kingdoms and then uh, what is it praising hindu rulers so that is not the actual story these people are actually uh, they are shouting because of their illiteracy nothing else okay so that happens it will continue to happen also that is the fate of this country as of now so but you should know at least you be knowing the story you being uh, literate enough uh, to understand the uh, things which happened you should know like it was not a hindu muslim battle okay because on either side there were hindus as well as muslims supporting the ruler okay now a small fo- force of the bills okay bill tribe and all you will learn later so also inspector may have taught you okay so the small force small force of the bills whom the rana had befriended was also present okay so it's like muslims are there tribes are there everybody are supporting now the rana's forces are put at 3000 uh, the onslaught by the rajputs and the afghans threw the mughal force into disarray but the rumors that akbar had arrived in person rallied them with fresh uh, mogal reinforcement the tide of battle began to turn against the rajput so initially uh, these people were uh, fighting some victory and also they uh, one problem happened is they thought like akbar has personally come to the war so that became, like so some people uh, what to say uh, turned away and then that way it was turning against the rajput okay so finally what happens is rana will escape okay rana will escape and then uh, mughal's forces were too tired to pursue him but after some time they advanced through the pass and occupied uh, gogunda a strong point which have been evacuated by the rana earlier so like this uh, places are getting occupied but rana personally escaped okay this was the last time rana engaged in a pitched battle with mughals and fourth he resorted to methods of guerrilla warfare so that is what happened he went away and no one could find him but he in uh, time and again he will come and attack these people through guerrilla warfare okay but the full fledged war he could not fight so this is the last battle which he fought and also in the history books uh, some books you can tell like this is one of the shortest battle in history okay i think only 3 hours or 4 hours this battle was fought okay around i think june 20 something june 21 or something okay uh, in 1576 okay i read it in a different textbook just tell me okay now uh, the defeat at haldigati did not weaken rana pratap's resolve to fight on for independence however the cause for which he stood had already been lost so it's like morally he was not defeated okay he was still he was still wanting to fight but uh, whatever he wanted to protect was like lost okay the places everything was lost most of the rajput states had accepted uh, mughal suzerainty but uh, by his policy of inducting the rajput rajas into mughal service and treating them on par with the mughal grandees according broad religious toleration to his subjects and his courteous behavior to former opponents akbar succeeded okay so all these four five points you can tell what all mughals uh, akbar did for uh, uh, maintaining peace okay giving high position to them uh, religious toleration then courteous behavior to opponents so all these things are good good points you can write for your answer also okay so that is how Raj, uh, akbar succeeded in cementing his alliance with the rajput rulers okay it's a very important section please make notes of these things therefore rana pratap's refusal to bow before the mughals had little effect on most of the other rajput states which realized that in the existing situation it was impossible for small states to stand out for long in favor of complete independence so the other rulers were not like too adamant like uh, uh, rana pratap okay he, the others were agreeing like okay this situation is better okay anyway we cannot find for complete independence so let's pay homage to akbar and then we will continue ruling okay that is what they believed now moreover by allowing a larger large measure of autonomy to rajput rajas akbar established an empire with those rajput rajas did, sorry by which those rajput rajas did not consider harmful to their best interest same thing again okay uh, uh, because they were given high positions they were okay with this thing akbar's policy okay i'm giving homage to akbar now rana pratap's defiance of the mighty mughal empire almost alone and unaided by other rajput states constitutes a glorious saga of rajput valor and the spirit of sacrifice for cherished principles rana Pr- pratap was also experimentally successfully experimented successfully with the methods of guerrilla warfare which were later to be elaborated further by uh, malik ambar the deccani general and by shivaji so if you see later you know 16th century you know shivaji will come deccan ruler this malik ambar will come so this rana pratap is the one who started this guerrilla warfare kind of thing and was kind of successful also okay so that is why uh, the story of rana pratap is like now made into movie tv series and all like if you know there are many rulers there are many ranas there are many rajput rulers but only few are glorified so this is the reason okay so you should know that this is the whole story of rana pratap okay now it is not necessary to discuss in detail the struggle between akbar and rana pratap for some time akbar exerted 
reliance uh, is pressure on the rana the mughals overran the states of uh, okay some places okay dungarpur uh, dungarpur uh, uh, banaswara sirohi etc which was which were dependent allies of mewar and had supported rana pratap akbar concluded separate treaties with these states thus uh, further isolating mewar so what akbar did is he went and uh, captured all those places okay treaties with all the other places which Prata, rana pratap can go and contact to, to raise an army so rana pratap was isolated he could not even he, if he wanted to come back there was no kingdom or no state which could offer him any army okay the rana was hunted from forest to forest and from valley to valley uh, both kumbalgar and udaipur were occupied by the mughals the rana underwent hard great hardships but thanks to the support of the bill chiefs okay the only tribal chiefs were one who were helping him he could continue his uh, defiance the mughal uh, pressure relaxed after 1579 due to a serious revolt in bihar and bengal in protest against some reforms affected by akbar okay so that time eastern side okay because you know this uh, bill chiefs all these people are on the west but in eastern side something happened in 1579 so akbar had to focus there so akbar's half brother mirza hakim made an incursion into the punjab in order to fish in troubled waters thus akbar had to face a most serious internal crisis in uh, 1585 akbar moved to lahore to watch the situation in the northwest which had become dangerous he remained there for the next 12 years no mughal expedition was sent against rana pratap after 1585 so here if you see some internal conflicts happened okay his half brother was creating problem in punjab uh, akbar had uh, faced problem in bengal and bihar in the east so many things were there and so akbar was focusing on that thing so uh, by 1585 the search for rana pratap was stopped okay so that's what we told here now taking advantage of this situation rana pratap recovered many of his territories including kumbalgar and the areas near chitor okay so that is why he is still like successful okay without any army with the bill uh, bill tribes alone he uh, with guerrilla warfare method he captured some areas okay near chitor during this period he built a new capital uh, chavand okay earlier we saw kumbalgar was the earlier capital and now a new capital okay chavand or something so near modern uh, dangarpur he died in 1597 at the young age of 51 due to an internal injury incurred by him while trying to draw a stiff bow so here it's like something internal happened it's not like a war or any battle he died like a uh, due to his own internal in- accident or whatever happened okay so that is the full story of rana pratap now apart from mewar akbar had to face opposition in marwa as well following the death of maldio 1562 there was a dispute for succession between his sons the younger son of maldio chandrasen who was the son of the favorite queen of maldio succeeded to the gaddi so this is another king another story okay due to the pressure of the mughals he had to give parts of his country in jagir to his elder brothers but chandrasen did not like this arrangement and after some time rose in rebellion so this king who uh, uh, who actually came in matrimonial alliance with akbar and all uh, after him his son when his came their internal conflict happened okay the younger son chandrasen with the elder brothers now akbar took marwa under direct mughal administration one reason being his desire to safeguard the mughal supply route to gujarat which passed through jodhpur okay so that place was strategically important for him okay because it was on the supply route to gujarat okay after its conquest akbar appointed raja uh, sorry rai singh bikaneri to look after jodhpur chandrasen re- uh, resisted valiantly and waged a guerrilla warfare but after some time he had to seek refuge in mewar even there he was hunted from place to place by the mughals he died in 1581 so that story is also over just mentioning some stories okay so it's like a, just for making a lengthy answer you can add, add all these things political history other than that there is no much important thing okay a couple of years later akbar conquered jodhpur upon uday singh the elder brother of uh, chandrasen okay the to strengthen his position uday singh married his daughter uh, jagat kosain something okay joda bai so here is actually joda bai so uh, but in history it, it keeps saying okay different textbook you will see that was uh, some other bai this is joda bai this thing but not at all important for us okay so akbar's eldest uh, son selim is also coming into picture here okay uh, uh, unlike the uh, dola from uh, form of earlier marriages the bridegroom party went to the raja's house and a number of hindu practices were followed this happened when akbar was residing at lahore okay so because of this importance maybe uh, it was again moving made to a movie also okay uh, akbar also had close personal relation with the ruler of bikaner and bundi who served in various campaigns with distinction in 1593 when the son in law of uh, rai singh of bikaner died due to a fall from the palki uh, palki or pallak okay akbar went uh, personally to the raja's house to console him and decided his daughter from performing sati as a children so here Uh, some other thing happened and just showing akbar's uh, greatness kind of thing okay he is going there and meeting this person and then even stopping the wife from performing sati because children were young so uh, social policies uh, religious policies all those things you can use this point okay one example only now rajput policy of akbar proved beneficial to the mughal state as well as to the rajputs the alliance secured to the mughal empire 
the services of the bravest warriors in India. Okay, so that also is one important thing. You know, this Man Singh, Bhagwan, this all these brave ruler, brave warriors. No, they are coming from the Rajput side. Now, the steadfast loyalty of the Rajputs became an important factor in the consolidation and expansion of the empire. The alliance ensured peace in Rajasthan and enabled the Rajputs to serve in far-flung areas of the empire without worrying about the safety of their homelands. By being enrolled into the imperial service, important positions in the empire was open to Rajput Rajas. Again, the aim point they are telling, okay. Thus, Bhagwan Das of Amber was appointed joint governor of Lahore, while his son Man Singh was placed in charge of Kabul. Okay, so they are getting places like Lahore, Kabul and all to govern. Later, Man Singh was appointed the governor of Bihar and Bengal. Other Rajput Rajas were placed in the charge of strategic provinces such as Agra, Ajmer, Gujarat at various times. As high grandees of the empire, they were granted jagis in addition to their hereditary kingdoms, thus augmenting their resources. Okay, this later you will see the reason for Akbar or the Mughal dynasty to collapse also was this thing. Okay, they gave that much jagis and wealth and all these things to these people that later later they did not have enough money or resources to even get even split it. Okay, that is what will happen. So Akbar's Rajput policy was continued by his successors Jahangir and Shah and this also is a prelim statement which you can put. Okay, Akbar's Rajput policy was continued by both Jahangir and Shah Jahan. Jahangir, whose mother was a Rajput princess, had himself married a Kachwala princess as well as the Jodhpur princess. Princesses of the house of Jaisalmer and Bikaner were also married to him. So again, if you see matrimonial alliance continued, that's all. Now, Jahangir gave the highest honour to the rulers of all these houses. The main achievement of Jahangir, however, was the settlement of the outstanding dispute between Mewar and uh, Mewar. Okay, so with Mewar, you know, there are a lot of issues. They were not coming under this, so Jahangir could solve it. Now, Rana Pratap had been succeeded by his son Amar Singh. Akbar had sent a series of expeditions against Amar Singh in order to force him to accept the conditions. Okay, so same like uh, Jahangir came, there's that side Amar Singh will come. Okay, now Jahangir himself was sent against him twice but could achieve little. After his assassination in 1605, uh, Jahangir took up the matter energetically. Three successive campaigns were launched, but they could not break the Rana's will. In 1613, uh, you know, the, by this time, Britishers also will come. Okay, that's a different story, but still. In 1613, Jahangir himself reached Ajmer to direct the campaign. Prince Khurram, Khurram is actually Shah Jahan, okay, was deputed with a large army to invade the mountainous parts of Mewar. The, uh, the heavy pressure of the Mughal army, the depopulation of the country and the uh, ruination of agriculture at last produced their effect. So, finally, after a lot of campaigns and all, Jahangir could capture Mewar. Okay. Many Sardars defected to the Mughals, the other pressed the Rana for peace. Okay. So, again, people internal thing, people are helping each other, people are betraying each other, something happened and finally the result is they got the place. Okay. Now, the Rana's son, Karan Singh, who was uh, deputed to proceed to Jahangir's court was graciously received. Okay, so they, they treated the opponent well. Now Jahangir got up from the throne, embraced him in Darbar and loaded him with gift. To save the Rana's prestige, Jahangir did not insist upon the Rana's paying personal homage to him and entering the royal service. Prince Karan was accorded the rank of 5000. So you see, that also is a huge rank, okay, which had been earlier accorded to the rulers of Jodhpur, Bikaner and Amber. He was to serve the Mughal emperor with a contingent of 1500 Savars. All the territories of Mewar, including Chittor, were restored. But in view of the strategic importance of Chittor, it was stipulated that its fortification could not be repaired. The Jahangir completed the task begun by Akbar and further strengthened the alliance with the Rajputs. Okay, so this is the whole story. Uh, I think we'll stop it here, else it will become more lengthy because next chap next uh, video, I think it will have, I think, uh, now is the page number 41, right? I think up to 48 or something this chapter is there. So that seven pages, we'll do it in the next video, okay? That will be again like the conclusion of a uh, few more uh, uh, expansion policies of the Mughal Empire, okay? including like Akbar's some policies. So that we'll see in the next chapter. Uh, meanwhile, you can all uh, watch other videos all, as well because I see some people are only watching history, okay? Or the history audience are not watching other things or the polity audience are not watching any other chapter. You, if you are a serious UPSC aspirant, please watch all the playlists because every playlist is designed for UPSC, okay? There's nothing like junk video or nothing which is not useful to you, okay? Different textbooks are being covered, different subjects are being covered, NCRT as a whole is covered. But if you see the view of uh, geography videos and all are like very, very less, it's less than even 100, okay? While spectrum videos are like, more than 2,000, 3,000 or even there are I think 7,000 views and all for some certain lectures of spectrum, okay. So we have the audience but they are like restricted to different playlists. So please, please watch everything if you are a very serious aspirant and also test series is open for you. You can enroll to whichever stage you are, prelim stage or uh, main test series 2018 or main test series 2019. Everything is open for you. So please watch everything before you ask the query, okay. Because I see under history uh, uh, video, comment will come like please start polity, please start geography. But you should realize that already things are started and things are in progress. So please, please watch all the other videos as well. Okay. So I'll come up with the next video soon. Give your feedback. Thank you and have a nice day.